So the other day I was talking to my aunt and she literally said, Ketia, do you go home and I'm dead? And then she said, Why are you talking about our family? Why are you telling people about it? When your aunt said that, she's focusing on the fact that you're not bringing honor to our family because you're talking about our family secrets, you're bringing up、um, painful, embarrassing stories to the public. Shame thrives in silence, secrecy, and judgment. And so that is kind of what's associated with we're not allowed to talk about stuff with shame because there's secrecy, there is this element of judgment. And shame in my family. Shame was a silencer. And so a lot of this notion of the honor and shame of the family is in relation to who? Other families, other people, right? The rest of society. I'd like to know where my dad was too, especially when I was younger. My mom, my older brother, and I, we lived in a quaint little apartment in Flushing, Queens. And every single day, My father would come after work and he would make us study, make us do our homework. He would educate us as best as he can. And after a few hours, he would leave. And for me, I thought that was just normal. I thought fathers had another home outside of our home. And this was an everyday thing. So he would come around five o'clock, make us do homework, sometimes feed us. And then he would leave. And then shortly thereafter, my mom would come back from her job, and that was the rest of our night. While I thought that was normal, and I just presumed he had another home, or he had his home that was separate from ours, I realized he was actually going to his home. His first home, the home with his first wife, I presumed, and whatever family he had there. And I actually thought that was normal too. So I thought,、well, why can't he just stay with ours? What's wrong with our family? Kids these days are so lucky because they have like a flick of a smartphone, and I realize I don't have a lot of pictures of my mom and me. Um, I don't have a lot of pictures of my dad and me, so I'm just pulling up some pictures. I know they like to do this on Instagram where they show a picture and then they zoom in on the face. <laughs> oh, how swollen I was. I feel like I still look at people like that. <laughs> Twenty years apart. <laughs> Twenty years apart. I feel like I'm the same, except my eyebrows are like a little bit more expensive now. But this is me. I think I might rock this hairstyle after this is over. One of my favorite pictures of my mom and me. This is the best family photo, and it's my favorite family photo. So that's my mom, my brother, and me. And whenever the word family comes up, this image always pops up in my head. So this is why it's also my favorite picture. I don't think I have a lot of pictures where I'm just very like dainty and like girly.、Uh, this is who I am. I'm very happy. It's probably a Christmas photo, or really run down, like very lean Christmas tree. But my mom did her best to always. Try to let us have a conventional, normal, and happy childhood. I know that for a fact. It wasn't until I was older I realized, oh, this is not a conventional family standard. Because when I went to friends' houses to play, I would realize sometimes their fathers would be in the home, and I thought. Your father lives here. Your father gets to stay here, and then I realized 
they have one family. News to me. And I guess that's when I realized my family is a little different. I didn't know what it was and it didn't hit me as hard, but I realized, okay, my father should be here, possibly, but he does leave at the end of the day. I, I found this picture. And I saw my dad in the background and I just wasn't that thrilled. And I just saw him in the background like, dude, what are you doing there? So to give you an explanation of what the actual makeup was, it's daughter, son, son from the first woman. And then my brother and me from my mom. So five kids in total, two separate households. Ready for the next explanation? Um, I don't have a lot of pictures with my dad, but the few that I have, it's so awkward to see. <laughs> It shows that I'm not very fond of him. Like, <laughs> also awkward. It's like, I don't really want to be here. <laughs> I thought this was really, really funny. It shows a lot of my essence. I'm looking at this picture and the way my dad has his hand around my shoulder is like I'm his like pal instead of his daughter. And in Korean, there's this word called talbabo, which is daughter dummy. It's a term for fathers who are just so in love with their like cute little princess daughters. I don't think he's a talbabo, and I don't think I'm that kind of that. <laughs> As a child, what your parents say is what it is. So he would say, you know, you have a brother, you have a brother and a sister and another brother. Aside from my main brother, if you will. And I think my father would inject these pieces of information and this fact. And I think when he left to go there, you know, his routine was to come and then go. And then we were left with my mom, my brother and me. My mom would remind us, no, they are not your siblings. No, do not believe that. She does not want any connection between her kids and his other kids. My favorite photo of my mom. She's very pretty. Is there a resemblance? <laughs> I feel like this was in Hawaii. I think these are some happy times. So I really like to think about her in a very happy stage in her life. I feel like I have a, I have like a habit of crashing birthday parties. I'm happy. I promise. I'm very happy. <laughs> I really want to show you this one. Okay. Um, I don't know how I got this photo, but it's pretty cool and pretty vintage. It shows how much of an academic my dad was, but do you see the resemblance? Do you see this resemblance? I looked at this and I was like, whoa, we have similar taste in glasses. Wow. If I didn't know them and they're behind the story, I would think this is such a cool, fresh, vintage picture. I mean, I, I think my mom's style is so, it's so, feminine and lovely it's very Farrah Fawcett a Korean Farrah Fawcett and I think my dad always had like cool specs so I will aptly call this the great wedding picture hoax of 1989-1992 so I think I was hanging out with a friend at her home and we were kids we loved to play we loved to play makeup, make-believe, and kids also love to show and tell. And I think at that point, my friend was opening up her family photos, and I think she was sharing her photos of her mom and dad's wedding. 
very beautiful. I saw a happy couple, a beautiful white dress, all the things that little girls love looking at. Who uh, we were just looking at it, and I saw this couple, which is her mom and dad, and I thought it was very, very lovely. And they looked all happy, and it was just a beautiful set of uh, wedding pictures. So I naturally thought my mom probably has her own set too. So I would go home after playing with my friend and say, "Hey, mom." Where are your wedding pictures? Can I see some? My friend showed me hers and I want to see some of yours. And I think she stopped in her tracks for a bit and said, well, I don't own any of them. I left them all in Korea before I came to America. Plausible answer. A few years down the line, uh, we're older elementary school kids and my mom wanted to visit Korea, visit her mom, her family. And it was my mom, my brother and I went to Korea for summer vacation. So while I was there, we were staying at my grandma's house and I said, while I'm here, why don't I ask them? Hey, grandma, where's mom's wedding pictures? She told me she left it here before she came to America. May I see them? My friend showed me her pictures and I thought they were very lovely. I want to see mom. I think my grandma must have been taken aback, but she had the sick sense to realize I should probably tell this little girl a white lie or just go with it. So my grandma actually said, Ooh, at this point, I sent these wedding pictures back to America, to your home, so that you can have it. So I thought it was okay because I thought the wedding pictures would be waiting for us in New York. So when we came back to New York, I asked my mom again, where are these wedding pictures? And she said, I don't know, I think they must have lost them in the mail. So why I say it's circa 1989 to 1992, I've been believing in this little white lie from age 5 to about age 9. So several years of me believing in this wedding picture hoax. So I didn't think nothing of it, but I figured I will never see these wedding pictures, but I'm sure that they exist. So I just trusted what these adults were saying and yeah, I just left it at that. I actually like this picture of my mom and dad. If I didn't know the reality behind everything, I would see this picture and think this is a very pretty picture of the two of them. I was about nine years old and I was playing with my friend at her house. We were painting our nails, it was a summer, so I was painting my nails hot pink and I was just painting them very naturally as a kid would and I think somebody was looking for me. I don't know if it was my mom or my mom's friend but they had called her house and she picked up the phone and then she handed it over to me. I don't remember how that news was communicated to me but I remember taking the phone, the news was then communicated and I just stood there like, huh, okay. I gave the phone back to her, she hung up, and I continued to paint my hot pink nails as if nothing happened. And soon thereafter, I think it slowly started to sink in what that meant. And I don't know what it meant, but I'm not gonna lie. I felt relief. I don't want to say that I was happy. I do not want to besmirch the name of the deceased, but as a kid and what image I had of my father when I heard that news, I was, I was relieved. I was very relieved. When he was alive, he was absent. When he was dead, he was just as absent. So it didn't make a difference for me. My mom made it very clear that after my father passed, none of the connections with him were alive either. So it always remained in my memory, in my heart, and in my being that my family was my mom, my brother, and me. No one else. This is something interesting. At our church, they have an entire a season 
where a photographer comes in, sets up, and takes pictures of every family in the church and makes an album out of it. And it's interesting because some people don't take the family photo because if there's an unconventional family structure, they try to avoid taking those photos that season. But I think I'm going to say good for my mom for taking these family photos because number one, where else are we going to take our family photos? Um, and she, I don't think she was bothered by the fact that it was her, my brother and me and the three of us and there was no husband or man around. So good for her for taking these pictures. And I would go through that church family album and always see our family picture there too. Because why not? We are a family. This is my family. But that's all part of the church family photo album. Where did the time go? I'm spitting pepperoni baja all over these flowers. <laughs> When was the first time um you ever came with me? So my father died in July of 1992. About 10 years later, my mother passed August 20, 2002. Oh, I remember saying a few words. I had to say it in Korean because, of course, we wanted to show my mom taught us, right? Me to speak Korean and English. So I said some few words in Korean. My brother said his words. Oh. I don't know why this one killed me the most. You lay a flower and then you say goodbye. The months leading up to my mom's death, it was just a lot of chaos and I had just finished my freshman year at Brandeis University and I look back at it and I was still a kid. I had just turned 19. That was the last birthday that I've had with my mom um, in June. And around that time, shortly after my birthday, that's when the cancer diagnosis came. She passed away from pancreatic cancer that cancer runs rampant and it's very quick and from diagnosis to death it was about two months. Um, I was a kid but I was very responsible. I had a job at a law firm but I had to quit because I wanted to go with her on every single doctor's appointment. I wanted to be there for her and I think I spent the rest of that summer from June about the, until the day she died in the hospital with her. And it was a very hard time for me as a kid and to see a body deteriorate and see the last moments on earth. But because I spent a continuous full two months with my mom, I was actually like so happy to be near her and so happy to be taking care of her. because of all the years she suffered as a single mom taking care of us. So, I thought it was my duty and it was my complete joy to spend all that time with her. And I stayed next to her until her very last breath. I didn't even recognize this picture until... Wow. Thank you to the person who made this for us because... The 
it's kind of a beautiful picture, you know? My mother died on August 20th, 2002. A very, very hot summer day. It was the few weeks leading up to that date where I found out that my brother and I, we were bastards. Or my brother and I, we were children out of wedlock. I had really hoped that they were a married couple but I think ultimately it was my body and my mind and my heart that was just protecting me from really knowing that truth. And I want to believe that it was because my mom was protecting me from this truth. So I went in there and I sheepishly, because it's awkward for me to ask something like, where is someone buried? So I asked her last name. I used his American name because he went by it and then um, I had to know the general month and date of death because that's usually around when you're buried. So I said July 92 and um, they gave me this map and said he's in this section and um, in a Korean family, a lot of emotions and a lot of questions, those things, they're not welcome. In fact, we're stifled. Me personally, I was always a curious child and I always asked a lot of questions. But in the matters of the heart and in the matters of the heart and family, I was supposed to just accept things as they were. Someone had to help me because I guess it's a little confusing. And she also asked me, the newer ones have plot numbers on it. Do you know if this is a newer one? And I was like, lady, this is the second time I've ever visited my dad in like 30 some odd years. I just didn't like that disunification. Especially when a family is supposed to be one unit and that just hurt me a lot. And then the very fact that they put us in this situation, it was just like a mess and I think that was just the most painful. So she said, okay, well, just follow the plot number. So I guess we're going on a hunt. We're gonna Da Vinci code this map and find, and this is my dad. I don't even remember what holidays, if any, we spent with him. I think we spent one Thanksgiving with him. Let me see if there's a number anywhere. Um, Another thing that hurt me was this disproportionate expectation between a father and his children. Okay, almost there. Does he even have the right to be our disciplinarian when he goes away? Like, he doesn't see us. How can he dictate to us all of this information and all of these rules and all of his expectations onto us? I'm not ready. Wait, wait, wait. I'm not ready. Okay, turn it off. I found it. Are you ready? Okay. Wait, let me... Okay. At first I was just like looking for the numbers like it was a game, but like I guess like when I went near it, it was like um kid, like um kind of like scary because I mean he died earlier than his neighbors, so like the gravesite is itself looks very antiquey and like I guess oxidized. And also it just seems a little um seems a little lonely and not as decorated. And um, there's no like, there's no like, nice epitaph or nice um, statement on his gravesite. You don't know his exact birth date or death date. You just know the years. So you know, I really need to say this. A lot of people and a, a lot of adult children right now think their mom is the best, and I'm sure they are. But my mom, she was amazing. She really was. She did everything that she could do. And she never let me feel all the things that my father made me feel. 
So why it was hidden? I think the first part is my mom felt ashamed. From her perspective, if she were to tell herself the story of why she fell in love with this man, why she came to America, why all of this happened, I'm sure she was not very proud of her decisions. I'm sure she was not very proud of following this guy and being convinced to go about his decisions. And so at that first level, I think my mom was ashamed of herself. South Korean society and therefore the immigrants who come from there to places like the United States, like my family, it is organized based on honor and shame. So there are these societies that tend to be more collectivistic, meaning that the unit that we analyze and we understand is not the individual, but it's the family, okay? So because that's the way South Korean society is organized, even with all the new Western American influences that have come in, that the notion is that you have to be in the world in a way that brings honor to the family and not bring shame to the family. So that means that those two things are always interrelated. I think generally Korean culture is a lot more conservative and how they navigate through shame is a bit different than American culture. And using my personal story, having children out of wedlock is very shameful. It's something that is not spoken about. When you live in this kind of honor, shame, organized society, you don't share a lot of business unless it's good, right? So good is fine. You can share that and there's a lot of boasting, right? My kid got into the top university. We just got the top business or got the top job. But anything outside of what would bring honor, there's no discussion, right? And you repress and internalize all of that. There's a lot of taboo topics in Korean culture, and that is a lot of um, basis for shame. So in many ways, the fact that it's aired to another, it, it, it leaves your body and leaves your emotional state and your psychic you know, capacity and you're sharing that with someone else is almost like a transgression. It is a very shame highlighted culture. And I think I would have been more comfortable talking about my family situation, the fact that we are children out of wedlock to people in America, like much more comfortably than people in Korea. Right, because you're supposed to repress everything within um, that is not uh, affirming or um, doesn't raise your status or provide honor. Uh, so that's why I think Koreans talk a lot about Han and, you know, it's the fact that we internalize so much, right? And so in some ways, Koreans are acknowledging that they're traumatized people. You know, there's a word in Korea, Korean called Tomun. Tomun is literally rumor. And I remember thinking, and hearing this statement a lot. <gasps> Which literally translates into, there's a rumor in the neighborhood. And a lot of things about my father and my mother, like they didn't want a rumor to be spread in the neighborhood. So I had this instant image of all oh, these village people, they're going to come knocking at my door, they're going to have like pitchforks and torches to tell me, oh, you didn't get into a top tier level university, shame, shame on you, or oh, this is your father and this is your story, very much shame. For immigrants, there's an even more of this impulse to cap or hide or, um, basically pretend that these issues or problems don't exist because they're trying so hard to make it in the United States and look good to the fellow Korean immigrant community and not be seen as, oh, they're one of the ones that failed. In the Korean language, we use the pronoun our for possession. For example, I don't say my family, 
my sister, my brother, my school, my dinner. We use the pronoun our. It's 우리. 우리 가족, 우리 엄마, 우리 동생, 우리 오빠, 우리 저녁. And I say this because Korean culture is very us-centered and family-centered and it's the family name and you can bring honor or dishonor based on your action. You know, it's a collectivist culture and it's about being connected. It's, it's, it's more of a, it's a we thing, right? Even if you say like, we don't say my house, we say our house, right? We don't say my mom, we say our mom, right? And so, so on the one hand, that's great. I mean, I think there's so much warmth, there's security and all that, but it can be a harsh thing if there's like severe judgment. Do I think it's more intense in South Korea? Yes, but that's because you're never able to just live for, by, unto yourself. Your actions reflect upon and have major consequences usually for your family unit or the community you're a part of and you know hometown it's a, it can go you know however big it makes sense when we were younger my mom was noted as a single mom yes and it's different because um well i learned later when we were born out of wedlock she was a baby mama right but the fact that my father died it was better that she was a widow than a baby mama yes it was so weird can i ask a quick question yeah. was he did he have another marriage already with kids in the entire oh so family. she was a mistress who had children yes okay got yes. it got it i just wanted to understand the full context yeah yeah so she uh, i i hate even saying that word but yes she was, she was yes and then even further that was kind of like kept under um wraps but when he died it was good that um we can say oh she's just a widower because being a widower is better than a mistress do you know what i'm trying to say yes about? Instead of yes. just like the other. In the status hierarchy, yeah. based on class, yeah. gender, uh, honor, shame, all of that is organizing the Confucian uh, reality that you have to have certain people on top and certain people on bottom. Yes, your mother was definitely low in terms of the family status hierarchy. Um, and the fact that the, she was a mistress, the children were born out of wedlock. She's not the main woman, right? Um, the main family. I'm sure that's not the picture of what she wanted to be to her children. And I think another reason why it was hidden from us was to guard us and protect us from this hurtful truth. I Okay. Have you ever done your own Jennifer? No. Oh. Are you um curious? We were doing some good faith work in India at my church. Um, in 2019 and we were learning about making up your family tree drawing out who's on this side who's on that side how people are connected and through that you can write little notes in your genogram that's what I did and in those notes I wrote what kind of you know traumas they might have had what their relationships were I went a little bit more substantive than the tree itself but here goes so I would draw my Dad. So while we were Drama encouraging God. these students to make up a family tree, um, we were there to kind of help out and help Me. them create their family tree, give them some advice. And then right. I just and saw the students brother. working on their family trees and I just sat down on, I, on my own. I sat down on my own and I started to build person. my family tree. Grandpa. And then... 
this is what this side looked like for me. People were having a grand old time thinking about their families. This one student, I think she had about 50 first cousins because she had about umpteen uncles and aunts. But the fact that she could recollect all that and I couldn't even recollect an entire side. And it just made me a little sad because there was just so much I didn't know. And just so much to uncover. But also, who doesn't want a big happy family, right? Yeah. I only know his name, his birth year, his death date, the children's names, and nothing. Each person has the story, right? They have the answer. And it's just this process of unearthing it and finding out what's there. And so what we try to do is to bring the unconscious to the conscious or just thing, you know, stories or themes or messages that folks have been so used to telling themselves and thinking it's just natural. And sometimes it's the counselor that comes in and says, huh, I wonder if, if there's another way to tell this story. It was in the summer of 2010 when my investigation started. A lot of law firms were becoming defunct. All of these offer letters for jobs were being rescinded. So here I was with a JD, finished my bar, thinking I did everything right, but all I was was left with no job, no prospects, and a lot of my thoughts. I think when I first um, contacted my brother, that was like the most nervous because I haven't talked to any of them for years. This was the moment when I was starting to be very introspective, thinking about who I was, what my story was, what my background was. It's interesting because I feel like I'm still in the process of my process, so the joy is not like, oh my god, yay! Like, I do feel very happy and th thankful and ambivalent too, but overall it's a very good experience. I love having to say I have a sister and I love bouncing off ideas with her and that's kind of new and that's kind of something that I really, really like about our relationship. But again, like, this is the third physical meeting, so we've come so far in terms of our relationship by just even meeting just three times. Turn right onto 9th Street. I was very torn because, you know, my mom had kept that family from us and cut ties with them. I thought by meeting them, I thought I was not doing right by my mom. Okay. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so you guys you guys knew of us and like was incorporating us into your conversations and like all of it? Like how how was when was that? Okay, so so we arrived in LA. Yeah. We spent about two weeks there. Yeah. And then we arrived in New York. And we moved into your mom's apartment in Flushing. All five of us with our immigration bags. Your mom, our dad, the three of you moved into your mom's apartment. Mom, brother, was I around? You were a baby. Of course you were around. You were oh, I was one. one. I was you one. Were, no, no, you were a baby. Because we arrived in January. 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 Yeah, yeah. Oh, so, so I was six, six months. I was old. an infant. So I only remember you as a sleeping baby. Oh. I never really... I don't sleep much anymore. No, no, but like you were basically baby <gasps> held by your grandma. So your grandma was there. Did you know that? Your grandma was there in your oh Flushing apartment. I don't know if you remember that apartment in Flushing. I do. We Me. lived there until...
you lived there until like, like even after a college graduation. You lived there for that long? The same place? My mom got sick there and that's how the we- The same flushing apartment? Yeah. But, oh, oh so like eight to 10 of us were in there. So we arrived there in the middle of the winter in New York City, all five of us to that apartment. And really, it's, that's our dad. That's how crazy he was. Because they went to their church. I feel like I have a picture of this lady. Well, that lady Somewhere. is the daughter of Kwak Yusuf, who's a famous person. And then they went to their church. Everyone went to their church. So is this your mom? That's my mom, and that's when dad was sick. Oh, he does look sick. You knowing this woman, what did you refer to her as? Your mom? You mean like when I was in Korea? Or yeah, like since. Were, were you like, oh, that's my dad's girlfriend? His no, friend? second wife is what I was saying. I mean, she was basically his wife, right? I mean, that's how I would refer. I thought friends. that until, you know, I didn't know until my mom was sick. The summer she was dying, I didn't know that they were never married. Mm. I, I didn't tell you this in our no, life. Not, you didn't tell me. That was a catalyst. You actually thought that they were married. And during that summer when my mom was uh, sick and dying, the fact came to me. And I, I, I think I really got sick. I see. Yeah, my stomach was in twist and knot because I said, oh my God, they were never married. And then my world kind of went upside down. So what happens when you think the world is a certain way and then find out that the world isn't? So like anything else, when you find out something new, it's going to be very, first of all, disorienting because your, your, new, your new normal can no longer be your old no, normal, right? You can't go back to what it was as much as you want to. So um, there, there's also grief, right? Because there's the loss of the life you thought you knew. I never processed it because, you know, my mom's sick. We had to take care of funeral arrangements. I'm like 19, my brother's 20, but like we're going like coffin shopping. We're like doing all the books and all of that, picking out a plot. Like these people from church were like, here, this is like all the plots that we have. Pick one where your mom's going to be buried. Like I'm a kid, but I don't have to decide yeah, that. Awesome. So like I couldn't even process that. But I think in my like late 20s, right around the time when I was like looking for you guys, I think I sat down and I was like, thinking about all this information. But hearing that, that really like changed a lot of who I thought who I was. Mm -hmm. You know, the... So when, when babies are first born, they're born into their families and um, the family unit is their introduction to the world, right? And so it is from the family that the little one learns, oh, the world is, I can trust the world. I can count on the world, right? But if if the family unit is one where, you know, where it's unstable in the sense of like, mom could be distant or cold, like, or dad is abusive or neglectful or whatever it is, right? It sends a message to the child that perhaps the world is also like that. So, so it kind of goes to that whole message of like, if, if a child learns or even told like, well, this is for your protection, they're going to associate protection with like, oh, it means protection means I'm not allowed to say things. I'm not allowed to feel how I, maybe even to feel what I feel about this thing that we're not allowed to talk about, whether it's sadness or anger or whatever it may be. So in the long run, yeah, it can really affect um, how they, yeah. Like it's harm, yeah, and it, it, harmful in the sense of like it impacts like how they relate to others, how they relate to themselves. So, hearing that news like really like messed up my world for some bit. Yeah, yeah. You know? But I think I shared with you when you last talked that what I saw was love between your parents. No, it really is true. I mean, you know, they did something really stupid, right? My dad, our dad had, was married and had three kids, 
they fell in love with your mom because they were working at the same bank. Yeah. I'm not going to take away that love that they had. You know, he was madly in love with your mom. And he then uh, moved to Hawaii with her. Left Do you know what year that was? 1973. We were seven, five, and three. Yeah, seven, five, and three. Yeah. I think the relationship that they had was real. Love was real. Mm -hmm. And they had two kids together. But what did you think when you were like a kid and your dad decides to... Oh, yeah, you know, this is very common among Korean men, especially men with certain means, right? Like they had several wives or girlfriends, water, water, water. Womanizing was not necessarily considered like the end of the world. Yeah, My dad yeah. was not unique. Our dad was not unique in that regard. So he didn't just have my mom and your mom. There were others. La 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 la. I, I, no, 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 I know. I was learning that recently too, like last week. What? I think me as a logical person, I would have known that. But I think I kind of kept on to like a hope because I don't want to think of things in a bad way or I didn't want the worst of it. So I, I mean, my aunt told me last week, she, she's like, your dad, oh, 바람 so it's not with yeah. just those two. No. And I was like, can you stop, stop, but tell me, I was like, la la la, but okay, tell me. So I would, I would put it this way. I think, it, you know, that in his culture, in his time, yeah. what he did was not like totally out of ordinary, but in his particular case, what happened as a child and the uh, the pain he had, the harm he experienced as a child, made him, you know, who he was. He was hurt. He experienced some really hardships as a child. I'm not making excuses. So I think, you know, he didn't have a good foundation. He, don't, he didn't really, he didn't have a good moral foundation. Who does stupid things like that? <laughs> Even if you fall in love with someone, you are married with three kids. What the heck are you doing? You stupid. <laughs> so he obviously did not have a good moral foundation because he was hurt as a child. They abandoned him. They abandoned him and his sister because their mom went to Seoul to support their son, her son, in medical school and left these two kids back in their hometown to take care of themselves. One was in middle school and our dad was in elementary school. I don't know what happened to them. They had no adults. No, no adults, no. So just the two of them, yes. abandoned and small children. Yes. And, you know, I don't know everything that happened but you know their family life as i understood it you know has some difficulties because dad's dad has some sort of a um, drug addiction um he was like a bureaucrat dealing with hospitals and clinics and i think he got addicted to heroin so that would tell us his memory of looking for the grandpa so that he could stop grandpa from taking drugs so he, he would tell us that he would go to the clinic and banging on the door where is my dad I'm like what kid would have to do that oh my God. yeah so I think you know I'm not making excuses but I think that he lacked something right and he yeah. also was needy probably and you know wanted love whatever that was and the love that he wanted was destructive love not Constructive love. A lot of things he did in life were destructive, including alcoholism and a lot of bad decisions he made. Lots and lots of stupid bad choices he made. Yeah. So you ask me, like, how was it? This is how I was. I was seven, five, and three. So you're seeing your dad abandoning you. you. You're seeing him off. Oh, I did not know that. At the time, I thought he was going off to study in England, New York, and I was very proud of him. I remember one year after this photo was taken, Dad came home and I was so happy to see him. Yeah. And I didn't think that that would be the last time. And then we didn't see him again until he came back. 
to bring us to the UFO. But nine that was nine later. years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what happens when people are not well inside and not healed. Then you end up doing stupid things and you end up hurting people that you are supposed to love and protect. And Brene Brown would say shame would basically be any feeling that makes us feel unworthy of love. Um, and psychologically, I guess it's the idea that you do something that's so incongruous and moral that um, it disconnects you from the rest of society. And then if I think even, I'm going to go into biblical perspective, right? If you just even look at the fall, it's very, um, you see what happens with sin. Yeah, so shame, um, like if you, you think about the story of Adam and Eve mm -hmm. in Genesis, um, when God did all of creation, he created Adam and Eve. Um, God said that it was very good. Everything in creation was good, and, and humans made in his image was very good. Mm -hmm. um, but God gave them, he said, you know, everything in the garden is yours. Um, you have everything that you need, but just don't eat from this tree of good and evil. When you had Adam and Eve just walking and they were naked, they were unafraid, right, before the fall. They were um, completely just as they were. So before the shame, you had freedom. But with sin came shame, and with shame comes fear. It comes blame, and then it, it, um, there comes disconnection. With shame, it's a reflection of myself. So I can feel shame towards myself and to others, but then this is a construct, and it's a perception of what others think of you, or you're coming in agreement with a false narrative, and I think that's what I've been doing. Imagine as we're growing up, the scripts that we tell ourselves um, because of us trying to understand the environment, mm -hmm. right? So what might be happening you know, with your parents, um, if they don't explain it to you in a way that is helpful for you to really understand, you're going to try to understand it from your perspective. Oh, that is a very good point. So empathy is the ability to remember that I'm human, that part of being human is I'm going to experience things in life and when they hurt, I'm going to say, ouch. Um, and then when I'm able to do that for myself, it is so much easier for me to do that for others, to create this space where I'm like, I also recognize that you are human and that you um, can experience life this way and that you have your own story. And then we can be, we can connect that way. I don't remember anything happy between my mom and dad mm -hmm. when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. Everything was stressful, everything, you know, they were always arguing. My dad was coming home drunk all the time. Yeah. He was a guy who drank and smoked and gambled. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what was going on mm -hmm. um, in my life. And I think if I really didn't have like the church and the community there, um, I would just be living this really disconnected life. When you had this community where you felt comfortable to share it with, it's almost like you're bringing all this dark 
darkness into light and all of the shame you're kind of bringing to the forefront and being like, these are things I want to like make dissipate. Right. So it's almost yeah. like you're getting rid of shame by bringing it to light. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly how it is. But who did you want to forgive? Probably my parents. Okay. Or what they did. It was, do I necessarily need to? Like, it's their decision or whatever they did. You know, but I guess their actions is generational, right? Because of what they did, it was imposed on me. So I'm part of, like, this Hoenn-ass family. So then because of that, it's just... It was... I don't know. It was transmitted for me. Like, mm -hmm. because shame was that relentless commitment to secrecy, it forced me to bury everything as if it didn't exist. Or if it was a page in a book, it was something that was to be turned and never looked back. And because of that, I was never able to reveal anything or discover anything to work through. Your emotional life was very stunted um, and it was very repressed. And so that's why you can't even then get to the next point, as you're saying, with being transitive about, oh, well, if I'm feeling anger or resentment or bitterness because of what you've done and I'm paying the price for it or I'm being pressured to be perfect because of it, you don't even recognize that you have any issues you're not able to recognize that you have any of that resentment and bitterness that needs to be let go of because forgiveness is letting go right but if you're not even taught what emotions are or what they look like or how they manifest then you're not even going to know that there's any emotions to let go of so how would you know that there was any forgiveness that needed to be done in my moments of forgiveness I was able to do that because it was a choice. I was able to do that because of information. So shame impeded on forgiveness. And then it impeded on my healing. So transitively, shame was an impediment to my healing. And I needed to know that information to help me go through each step. What is that? Acapulco's right here. I always wonder where Acapulco is because my dad went away without us. <laughs> but got me a souvenir from it. And this is me finding out where it was on the map. God's love never diminishes. And that's hard for us to understand. But that's the truth. And I think that's why we have to go back to some of the things that are really truthful that it's hard for us to understand and actually make that our foundation. If that was covering our households and our minds and hearts, I feel like sometimes things would have been played out a bit better. Right, yeah, yeah. It sounds like even if there are people in society, even if there are people in the world who are going to label you or say what it's like, what God says about you, right. Right. triumphs over what society, what the world says, and we either choose to believe what God says in word or we choose to listen to right the world and the people around us they will continue to judge us or condemn us or try to make us live better um, and whatever that better means none of us can strive and achieve what a great great cat to to live fully and to who you created her to be Thank you, God, that she is your beloved daughter. We thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I just wanted to ask, what is your cat's name? Um, it's Bot Milik, mm -hmm. and it means um, daughter of a king. It's from Second Corinthians. It's, um, you know, because it, it was a reminder for being daughter of the Most High. And Mom and Dad, when you both died, I was left with an insufficient epilogue. You could understand my shock when I uncovered your respective stories. Amma, it was only a matter of time until the information met my ears. I know the intention was to protect our household, 
And I know you loved your children with every ounce of your being. But ultimately, this secrecy damaged me mentally and emotionally. I think that you and I are our dad's daughters. <laughs> I mean, you don't have that much memory of him, but I see him in you. I see him in you. Dad, you were a hurt person who hurt others. I loathed you in my youth. I pitied you in my adolescence. I learned about you in my adulthood. I forgive you both. I thank you both. Through your absence, I was given this gift of opportunity to uncover the mysteries of our history. He left us? Yeah, I was going to say, what more else? Yeah, it's simple. Like, he left us. Like two kick ass, <laughs> strong women. Your intertwined stories beautifully resolve most of the epilogue, the entirety of which seeks to be written. And with that, I can now finish the rest about our family's healing. We would have found this way back. This would have happened anyway. I'm not sure. I, I think you have to take some credit for it. Okay, I will. <laughs> no, 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 but, no, 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 but it's also your reception of that. Knowing me, I, I definitely think I would have made this journey. It was a matter of when, but I had to mature first. I had to like get there. I had to say, okay, well, this is the project that I'm going to do. This is the goal for it. This is a commitment to no longer being ashamed, a commitment to not having secrecy, a commitment to healing. And so I really feel like you would have made its way here. You both would have, I think. I appreciate and love that you found me. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't need to be. Well, I'm not stupid. <laughs> it's a smart thing to, you know, find the sister. So you are the gift that our dad gave me. Thank you for letting me be born. Amma, Appa, I honor you. Thank mm -hmm. you.